Hello and welcome to Alfie Ordinary's Living Legends, the show where we'll be getting to know some of the most celebrated performers of the UK drag scene. I'm Alfie Ordinary and I'll be sitting down with drag royalty to talk big gigs, big wigs and what it means to be a living legend. And speaking of living legends, an infamous anarchist who rose to notoriety in the 1990s with his cult Channel 4 show The Divine David Presents. David Hoyle stands as one of the most iconic names in the UK cabaret scene, having worked in theatre, film and television for over 40 years. David Hoyle himself. Hello, David, how Hello, are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. Oh. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, well, no, thank you so much for being here. It's, it's an honour to have you here. Do you like what I've done with the place? I love it, <laughs> and I love what you're doing. It's very important. Oh, gorgeous. Well, thank you so much for coming and uh, being a part of, uh, of this project. I feel honoured to be in front of, uh, of a living legend thank um, you very yourself. Much. So, for those of you who don't know, where have you been? Um, but um, you are David Hoyle, um, yes, a, a celebrated drag performer. Um, I would say an oracle a prophet of the UK drag scene. You've had a, a long and wonderful yeah. uh, career. You've done your theatre shows, um, you've yeah. done your telly shows. Um, but I'd like to start at the beginning, a very good place to start. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about your very first gig? Yes, uh, well I was always interested in the theatre and performing. Yeah. And so coming from Blackpool, that was a perfect place. Um, to make inroads, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I was very lucky in as much as I worked at British Home Stores. Yeah. And it was back in the day when there was a working class and they had money and they came to Blackpool to have a wonderful time. And so, say, of a lunchtime, um, there'd be various venues around the town centre that would have a band and members of the public would get up and um, do a couple of songs, usually Danny Boy, Ave Maria, my way. Yeah. And I gradually made inroads and asked the band if I could perform. And I'd do things like The Lady is a Tramp, yeah. um, Hey Big Spender, uh -huh. this sort of thing. And it was a wonderful experience. And I have to say that British Home Stores helped me and they encouraged me. Uh, and there was a lady there who was called Sandra Todd. I don't know what happened to Sandra. I've not seen these lovely people for years. Um, but I'm always grateful to each and every one of them. Um, because as I say, that was a wonderful way to get experience. Oh my gosh, well Sandra, if you are watching, thank yeah. you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so, so you were working there, um, yeah. that was, that was, was it your first job? Yeah, I worked at British Home Stores. Um, How old were you at the time? 17 when oh. I started. I started as a Saturday staff, yeah. and then as the years went on, became more full time. And I left British Home Stores when I was 21, yeah. and then I relocated to London. Oh, I see. Um, in the early 80s, mm -hmm. very much that time frame covered by the recent programme, It's a Sin. <gasps> oh, yes. And so that brought back a lot of memories for me. Oh, I bet. So what it was really London did. like in the 80s when you, when you moved there? Well, it was a lot cheaper than it is now. <laughs> That's the thing. When I'm watching yeah. It's a Sin, I couldn't believe when they yeah. talk about how much they pay. I know, incredible. And you could get a decent flat, you know, yeah. um, for With quite cheap palace. money. <laughs> uh, a lot of us were on the dole. We were getting housing benefit. Uh, and it was a wonderful opportunity mm. to develop. So you were, you'd moved to London as a, a, a jobbing actor? Um, yes, that's right, yeah. because um, with the help of British Home Stores and doing the performances, I'd managed to get an equity card. <gasps> right. So therefore, when I moved to London, I was able to do extras work, uh, both in television and in adverts, this sort of thing. And that paid for the drink and the drugs and all the rest of it, you know. And I, I just had a wonderful time. Oh, great. So what about your first gig in um, what would then be known as like a gay bar or a drag bar? Yeah. Well, that would be, again, probably in Blackpool uh -huh. because we had a wonderful bar there for the gay scene and that was Lucy's bar. Right. And I think I did like a Shirley Bassey number. Great. Uh, what did you look like at the time? Well, what can I say? <laughs> uh, again, I've always been into the improvisational. Mm -hmm. So I probably looked a bit rough, actually. Um, but it, again, it was the experience. Yeah, of course. And back in those days, when I was a teenager on the gay scene in Blackpool, we'd end the evening, all of us holding hands, and we'd sing that song by um, Brotherhood of Man, United We Stand. Right. 
uh, and very, very happy memories of that time. I think people were very, perhaps more politically motivated then. And certainly when I moved to London in the early 80s, mm -hmm. we were all involved in the anti-apartheid movement. We were all going on um, gay pride marches and they were a lot smaller in those days. Yeah. Um, but a wonderful feeling of coming together because it literally was people from all over the country, small towns and villages, relocating to London, people letting their hair down and just having a wonderful time, basically. Sadly, of course, as we know from It's a Sin, HIV came onto the scene and um, was absolutely decimating, Gosh. really. Yeah. So you were talking about the prides that you, you yeah. were, were part of. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I know what prides are like now. Sure. Um, here in uh, Brighton, we of have course. headliners like Mariah Carey and Britney Spears and Kylie. Yeah. What was it like in the 80s in London? What, was, what, was your, what, was, what did pride well, look like? I think some of them, I mean, you would get the support of somebody like Divine, say, yeah. and that was absolutely magnificent. Um, there'd be clubs that you could go to after the march, and it was just the community, the sense of community. Yeah. Um, which we perhaps hadn't experienced um, in our lives prior to moving to London. My gosh. And it was just the scale of it. Mm. You know, again, it was getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, and the solidarity. Um, you couldn't really be into gay rights and ignore the anti-apartheid movement. Yeah. So everything was hand in hand. Um, and it was a wonderful time for political growth. Um, it was very interesting sociologically, you know. I met a lot of interesting people, let's put it that way. I had quite a few experiences, oh, yeah. you know, uh, some of them teetering on the erotic. Mm. And you could let your hair down. Yeah. But as I say, sadly, HIV came onto the scene and uh, it was a bit of a bucket of cold water, really. So were you performing in cabaret um, and drag at, at that time in the early yeah. 80s? Yeah. Um, when I moved to London in the early 80s, as I say, I did the extras work. Mm -hmm. So if you look at early episodes of EastEnders, for example, you might see me um, in conversation with Rowley. I don't know <gasps> if you remember Rowley, the giant the poodle. poodle. <gasps> So I'd be in the background with Roly the Poodle because, of course, it was Dan and Angie in yes. those days. They were the big stars of it. Yeah. Um, and then I might do a commercial. I remember being in a Blue Circle cement commercial. Um, do, you, do you have copies of, of, of this? No, I haven't. Oh, no, I've, I've not really monumentalised anything that I've done. To me, it's all ephemeral and it just goes into the atmosphere, yeah. you know. But happy days. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, and also I got into a fringe production of the Rocky Horror Show. Of course, and that was a touring. We show, toured. Wasn't it? Yeah, we did the gay clubs of the South Coast. Oh, gorgeous! Yeah, and that was it was a lot of fun, and I was very lucky in as much as I was playing riff raff. Yeah. So therefore, I had the song, the time warp. Yeah. And you can't go wrong. No, of course not. Because okay. everybody knows it and everybody likes to participate. In the, the mid-80s, you moved back yeah, up, I did. up north, up yeah. to Manchester. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that is... was because all those um, boys and girls that had gone down to London to have a good time, uh, you were suddenly surrounded by death oh, and people gosh. dying. Uh, I mean, in my early 20s, I lost so many people. I mean, ordinarily you'd go through that kind of loss in your 60s, your 70s, yeah. your 80s, you know, and I still feel that it's, it's gone unreported in a way. Uh, and so it was a thrill to see It's a Sin Absolutely. and to have that portrayed. It's incredible that we, we, we've, got, we've come all this way, all this yeah. time, and that's the kind of first time we've seen that story being so. told, and yeah. it's told very beautifully. Yeah. And so you, you left London, Yes. Um, and back to Manchester. Yeah, back to the north of England. And um, I found myself in Manchester. Uh -huh. And I've been there ever since. Oh, my. Yeah. I got involved with a theatre and education company. Yeah. As an illustrator. All right. To do the illustrations for the teachers' education packs. So, I, say they were doing um, a project on medieval history, because, of course, Manchester Cathedral goes back hundreds of years. I'd be drawing the cardinals and all the church people, but with massive eye eyelashes and this sort of thing. Camp. And yes, and the <laughs> theatrical was just pouring out of me. Yeah. And then I ended up performing for the theatre and education company. And again, more experience. 
you know, performing. Okay. When did sort of the, the drag start and the cabaret? When, when, when yeah. did um, David Hall that we see now, when did, when did that kind yeah. of start? Well, or? again, that was an evolution, Elfie. Yeah. Uh, what happened was I was a pub cleaner. Uh -huh. And a friend of mine, she was very, and she still is, very talented with fabric and making costumes and sculpture and all sorts of things. And she was having an evening at the pub where I cleaned. As luck would have it, the owners of the pub were there that night. Yeah. And she'd asked me to go on the mic and describe the costumes as they were coming down the catwalk. And the owner said, we were there last night. We heard you. You sounded good on the microphone. Now, this is going back because... In those days, nobody was doing quiz nights. And they said, we're thinking of starting a quiz night. Would you be interested in being like the quiz master? Quiz master. Yeah. And I said, of course, I'll give it a go. Yeah. You know, because it was a student pub. And I've got to say that first thing in the morning, um, quite unsavory sights. Oh, I bet. Particularly in the toilets. Ooh. Yeah. I'll yeah. leave it there. So you started a, a quiz night. Yes. Incredible. And what happened was, it said on a sort of an A board, you know, a blackboard outside the venue, quiz with David. And I saw it and I thought, mm, it needs to be jazzed up. It needs to be a bit more interesting. Why not put quiz with the divine David? <gasps> oh, my gosh. You know, and it it's became a cult that. show. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So, I mean... A, well, a I started it. I'd just have my trainers on, jeans and a T-shirt. Yeah. But as the weeks went on, a little bit of nail varnish should go on, a little bit of eye makeup. Uh -huh. Then, of course, Jackie helped me with the costumes. And so it was just getting bigger and more outlandish with each passing oh week until we couldn't do it at the original venue anymore. And so it was a progression right. up um, Oxford Road in Manchester. And then eventually found my way into the city centre. But from there, I ended up hosting um, like Manumission. They mm -hmm. went on to Ibiza doing some shows at the Hacienda. They had a wonderful evening called Flesh uh, for the LGBT plus community. And it just went from there, really. My gosh. So those of you watching might know uh, David as the Divine David from the hit TV show on yes. Channel 4, wasn't it? Yeah, in the 4. 90s. When Channel 4 was Channel 4. Oh, oh I see. Um, so how did this come about? Um, I mean, I've seen yeah. clips of the show. They're on the internet. If you haven't well, seen that it, Well, that happened. Myself and my friend Ben, yeah. we made these short films and Channel 4 had a programme called Takeover Television and you were invited to send your short films in and so we did and our films invariably were always shown and so there was a bit of a relationship building up between ourselves and Channel 4 and to cut a long story short, as the years went by, the Divine David Presents as a programme, as a concept came to fruition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't an overnight thing, you know, we, we put years into it. The Divine David presents, if they were kind of um, skits and moments, weren't they? And mm -hmm. um, uh, you describe yourself as a, an anarchist. Yes, um, yeah. And, and yeah. visually, you were working with green screen, and this is, this yes. is, this is years before, yeah. you know, the yeah, green yeah. screens were, were a thing. Absolutely. And, and um, it, it was, was avant-garde. You avant -garde. have a strong relationship with the avant-garde. Very much um, so. Can you tell me sort of, where do you think that comes from? I think I'm naturally anarchic. Yeah. Uh, also, I think I was exposed to an overdose of the heteronormative at a, an impressionable age. And I have absolutely no faith or belief in the heteronormative. When I look at what you're doing and what we're doing now, we are liberated. But the unliberated people, the heteronormative people, they are the ones that need liberating. Mm. They're still very contained. I think they believe that the more small-minded you are, narrow-minded and unimaginative you are, the more chance you have of getting into heaven. Uh. <laughs> they must see heaven as a very sort of monotonous, um, horrific place of convention. It sounds dreadfully boring. Yeah. <laughs> I exactly. know which way I'd like to go, yeah, to be honest. definitely. So, obviously, we're talking about the, the heteronormative yeah. and the kind of, the oppressive nature yeah. um, of that. Um, yeah. uh, would you say that your 
um, your performance style, your your clothing, what you what you how you choose to present. Is that a, a, a direct response to that? Absolutely. There's yeah, something. It's a, it's a two fingers. It's a spit in the face. Yeah, Absolutely. It's yeah. a punk being yeah, free. Yeah. I mean, to be told how to be by the most boring, unimaginable people on earth is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I know that's why I. I when do people it. refer to us making a lifestyle choice, that is a lie. You know, who would choose mm. to be different, which means then you're going to be bullied mm -hmm. by these very unimaginative people, spiteful, peevish, because they lack the confidence to be themselves. Yeah. And so obviously this results in a lot of envy and a lot of hatred. But as I say, we are liberated. Yeah. They aren't. And it's the two fingers up. Yeah. Of I can wear and also, this. also hopefully encouraging them to be as liberated and as together and as mentally healthy as we are. I get it. I get pulled aside. But they've had a, a few too many to drink and they're like, I think what you do is wonderful. You're of so, course. You're so just, it's so lovely to see this. And, you, yeah, and yeah. I remember, well, do it yourself. I remember just saying, you can do this. You can do it. Or they say, oh, you look amazing. And it's like, yeah. well, you, oh, I wish I could wear that. And you we can. can help each other. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, this is happy. I've come with this sort of colour scheme. And I didn't know in advance that this was happening. This was not planned. You know? No. Um, some of this jewellery has been given to me yeah. by, by friends who also dress up, you know. Mm -hmm. My hair, this is from Vida, who works in Dublin, in Ireland, you know, and it's wonderful how we've formed a community and we help each other. I love that. Yeah, I mean, in my personal experience, one of the best parts about doing this, the business we call yeah. show, is the community that it comes yeah. with. Um, yeah. And uh, This was from Christine. Oh, was it? Yeah, I love Christine. Christine. Because oh. we've married. Um, oh, I know. How long have you been married for now? Well, we've exchanged solemn vows on at least three occasions. Oh, fantastic. It's quite difficult to utter a solemn vow when Christine's actually sat on your face. Oh, really? But okay. I could almost tell you what she eats. <laughs> <gasps> Every piece has a story to tell, as you know. This is one of my favourite rings. Yeah. And this was given to me by Holstar. <gasps> I love Holstar. And I think that Holstar is pa a pioneer within drag and proves that drag is an umbrella term. Yeah. And we're all a family and we can all help each other. I did a show with Holstar once um, where the running order, as they are, yeah. uh, was, was on the wall and all of our, our names were there. And Holstar, for some reason, I guess through the booking had come through Facebook, it just said, Julie. <laughs> and she walked in the room and she saw it and she just went, who the fuck is Julie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice one. <laughs> Love yeah. Holstar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I don't know if you know this, but uh, my first ever cabaret show uh, drag experience as an audience member um, was actually yourself at the RVT, the Royal Vauxhall Tavern in, in Vauxhall in London. Wow. Um, so first off, thank you so much. Um, I would say you have, uh, you are partly responsible for, for all this here. Well, I'm um, very it proud was of that. Uh, a kind of life affirming and changing okay. experience as a young yeah. queer person to go and see. Well, I think a lot like of yourself. people have that experience because going back to life in the early eighties in London. I used to see Lily Savage uh, on a Thursday evening. At the RVT? At the RVT in the early 80s, doing a fantastic show called Stars of the Future. Yeah. And that was a talent show. And Lily was very much in charge. I'd stand at the back near the exit because I was terrified at the idea that Lily might speak to me. Little realizing that one day I'd be on that stage myself. Absolutely. Um, happy days. And I always say, if the RVT is good enough for Lily Savage, it's good enough for me Absolutely. because I was such a fan. And I had that, the same moment with you. I saw you on the stage there. Yeah. Um, and then a few years later, I was there doing my own, um, Lovely. My own show. Um, yeah. And so it is this wonderful space. That, it's that a really, crucible, isn't it? Yes. Um, it's a space of cultural importance, yeah. officially. It's a place where, where young, young queer talent can, yeah. can thrive because yeah. not only do they, do they have, you know, this legendary space with these legendary mm -hmm. people performing, you could have that on the Friday night and uh, on the, the night before you can have a kind of uh, people that are brand new to performing on the Absolutely. same stage. And I think that's wonderful. Well, personally, I feel that members of the LGBTQ plus community, 
we can be accused of being irresponsible. I'm getting older um, and I like being responsible and I like the idea of promoting younger artists because to get onto the stage in front of an audience you can't pay for that experience and that experience is essential in any performer's career and so I've enjoyed reaching out, being with the younger people. As far as I'm concerned that is a two-way street. Yeah. I learn, they have the opportunity to appear in front of an audience, you know, be it at the Marlborough or the RVT, two wonderful essential places for our art and expression. And I think it's a very important job that you do in terms of the relationship between um, people like yourselves mm -hmm. and, and young queer artists and audiences. I think essentially you are um, helping the, the genre and the art form continue and well, I hope so. evolve and develop, I hope uh, which so. is an important... To uh, me, drag is an umbrella term. It's all encompassing and it's all embracing and it's about inclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, again, going back to this ring, Holstar gave me that, and this ring means a hell of a lot to me. Again, the bracelet. This was a gift from Christine mm -hmm. when we got married. And these are very different types of drag performers. Yeah, the very two much that so. you've mentioned, very different, but yeah, they're, all, very much they're so. both people that you've worked with, yeah. that you have a close relationship yeah. with, and yeah. that's, that's but wonderful. But still part of our greater drag family. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. Uh, going back, I know that one of the legends you're going to be interviewing is Dave Lynn. Yes. And I can remember way back in Blackpool, on a small black and white portable television flickering away. And it was a programme, I think, about Dave Lynn. Now, Dave must only be a few years older than me, although looks a lot younger. Oh, so fantastic. I'm going to try and find out what that secret <laughs> is. But anyway, <clears throat> Dave Lynn was on the television. And I think it was about the idea of being gay and also being a person of faith. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the whole programme culminated in Dave doing My Yiddish Mama, yeah. which he still does to but devastation. Part of that now, absolutely. Yeah. You'd have to be made out of stone not to be moved, you yeah. know. Yeah. And that was a very interesting concept, the idea of gay people being spiritual, because the adults in my life were trying to convince me that you couldn't possibly be spiritual. Mm, well, you grew up in a, a religious household, didn't you? Well, I, I grew up in a religious society, let's yeah. put it that. I don't want to be specific. It's not about blaming and shaming. It's just about acknowledging mm -hmm. the times that I lived in. So, you know, I was born in 1962, so the 60s and the 70s weren't a particularly enlightened period. So seeing somebody like Dave Lynn on the television was food for my soul and it gave me hope and this goes on you so know. we we pass on yeah, kind of experiences very much and, so gosh wow yeah, this yeah. weird full circle moment that's happening exactly me and you sitting down together and it replenishes Dave. itself it's yeah. just wonderful it will never gosh. end because it's an, a necessary evolution yeah because the heteronormative is the problem the heteronormative people need to free themselves we are free we don't go to the heteronormative and ask them to set us free they should look at us and try to free themselves and until they do they're going to be discriminatory they're going to be violent they're going to be weird I'll leave it with you. Oh, leave it with me. So um, you are quite a spiritual person yourself. Yeah. Um, well, I think I... everybody is. Absolutely. Uh, some people might say I'm fiercely uh, atheist. Therefore, they'll be humanitarian. And so let's not quibble over a word. Be you spiritual or be you motivated by humanitarianism. To me, pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And it's about helping each other and sort of realizing that we have to connect outside perhaps of capitalism and the very cruel system mm. that we're living in. We're living in times that are increasingly fascistic. Uh, I actually believe we're living in a fascist dystopia. Therefore, people need art 
and expression to hopefully again liberate them and so that the scales will fall from their eyes. Mm. So for anyone that's not been to see you live, um, yeah. I, I try and describe to people your shows. It feels like you are at church listening, yeah, listening well, to it, a sermon. It's funny you should say that, Alfie, because say I'm in the dressing room five minutes before curtain up. I'll say to somebody, I've no idea what I'm going to say tonight. And that can be quite nerve wracking. Yeah. But once I'm walking towards the mic stand and the microphone's there, the people are there, together, collectively, we create something. And of course that's spiritual. Um, if I'm a conduit of spirit, so be it. My gosh. So we've gone back 40 years in the industry you've yeah. been in. Oh, yeah. Um, can you tell me a bit about what's changed, if, if anything, through, through that yeah. time? Uh, again, as I say, it's sort of... Replenishing itself now, yeah. you know, and we've got so many exciting drag kings yeah. and so many developments, you know, mm. things that would never have been foreseen and it's happening and it's real. Um, so I've got every faith and confidence in the future um, and drag, it's a liberating force and it will go on doing its very powerful oh work. God. You have performed all over the world. Uh, your career's taken you, obviously, on the television yeah. and uh, across the country and across yeah. the world. You performed at Sydney Opera House. Yeah. Um, and the National Theatre of Norway. Yes, that's right. Um, and you were just... You and were in talking... Norway, uh, sorry to interject. No, it's all right. Um, we were invited to do a show in the foyer of the National Theatre yeah. of Norway. And they hadn't had sort of a gay pride presentation in that building prior to that show. So that was a huge honour. Oh, wow. Uh, and we did the show there. We were invited back the year after, which was amazing. Um, Norway's a very interesting country, and of course we've got the Sami people and all the rest of it, and we brought everybody into the mix. The second time I went, they showed me a door, and they said, right, open that door. There is your dressing room. And I opened the door. It was the most magnificent room, lots of marble, lots of gold, lots of oil paintings along the walls. And it's the room that the Norwegian royal family utilised prior to them going into the royal box. Oh my God. And obviously it was a huge honour to be able to... I, I just burst into tears, I just couldn't believe it. So you were there as a guest of the... Well, they the can't family. use that room without their express permission. <gasps> so it was pretty amazing. Oh my gosh. I'm guessing that was a, a highlight of your, one, your yeah, career, definitely, one of those moments. Yeah. And it wasn't last year, obviously, because of the lockdown and all the rest of it, the, the year before. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, it definitely was a high point. It was okay. amazing. Oh, gorgeous. So we've yeah. spoken a lot about the past. Yeah. Um, what are you up to now? What, what's... Well, now I'm back working with Jen Hayes. Uh, Joan Hayes is a Liverpool-based theatre maker and she had the idea to revisit Henrik Ibsen's Hedda Gabler and so I'm going to be Hedda but also the other characters within the play right. and <clears throat> this is exciting, it's challenging. Um, Jen is also a very skilled songwriter so I'm going to be singing some of Jen's songs. Um, I enjoy painting, mm -hmm. I enjoy drawing. During the presentation, some of my paintings have been animated <gasps> by students at Edge Hill University. So it's going to be visually interesting as well as hourly. And I'm really enjoying working with Jen on this production. Oh my gosh, it all sounds... Incredible. And it just shows, you know, you can do drag one minute mm -hmm. and where it will evolve, where it will take you. From your days cleaning you know, the... I, I never knew that I was going to be directed by Todd Haynes no. and costumed by Sandy Powell, but that really has happened in my life. Oh my gosh, and that was part of the, the Velvet Goldmine yeah, that's that you right. were in. Yeah. Um, you're in another film coming up soon, aren't yeah. you? Everybody's talking about Jamie. Yeah, yeah. And um, you had a consultant. Role? I did. I was. I got a consultancy fee for working with the one and only Richard E. Grant. Oh my gosh! And it was lovely to be around Richard. Um, we're in Brighton now, and actually, Richard joined me in my dressing room um, at the Spiegel tent. At the Spiegel tent. Yeah, not the Spiegel tent. Yeah, and uh, it was. It was doing a character study, you okay. know. 
Um, but wonderful to be around. Wonderful. And again, you know, I never knew that I was going to meet somebody like him when I first started. No, I think this is the wonderful thing about uh, the industry that we're in. Yeah. No two days are the same. No. Um, and you honestly don't know where, you don't. where you the don't. limits are. So um, keep at it. Absolutely. Do you, you know. have any, is there any one thing that you would really like to do um, uh, in this industry? What's What's the kind of... What's the that one moment yeah. that you think? I yeah. mean, you you could have already done it. You're you're welcome to say yeah, yeah. that you've already done it. Um, is there my my? Uh, I've been speaking about this a lot. I want a Christmas number one. I'm putting it out there into the. Uh, into well, the I I think what I'd like to see is um, drag integrated more fully into our society. Mm -hmm. When children start school, say at the age of five, why can't there be hampers of clothes? that they can help themselves to, to develop their own identity. Also, why can't children learn to make their own clothes, to make their own shoes, and to grow their own food? I think that would be something I'd like to be involved in. Because I think that from the age of five, you're encouraged to be yourself by the, and make your own clothes. By the time you're 16, you are going to have your own identity An incredible and because everybody's that, yeah. doing it everybody so you're will saying, throw away the rules yeah gosh david hoyle for education secretary i would say i'm putting that out into the atmosphere as well yeah. and on that note for anyone that doesn't know where can we find you say online uh, um, yes i'm on uh, instagram believe it or not oh. uh, alfie david hoyle universal david hoyle universal that's going to be yeah. written down here what i've tended to do there is put my paintings on. oh i love that yeah i love that um and what about um in person in real life in person uh, i what, shall what? be returning to the rvt of course stunning you know? yeah as long as there's life in my body i'll always be available sometime along so the no plans the to no plans to quit no. No, thank goodness for no, that. No. Um, Under no well, circumstances. I, I look forward to seeing you at the yeah. RBT. I Down say sometimes Brighton. stick around, even if it's only to spite people. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, um, thank you so much. Um, it's been an honour having you. Thank uh, you so thank much. Thank you so much for watching. And we'll see it. you soon. Take care. Lots thank of love. You. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>